Ladies and gentlemen, a happy Halloween. Welcome to the famed Orpheum Theater in downtown Los Angeles. Tonight we come here to celebrate the 61st anniversary of the death of a man who not only changed the face of magic, but elevated the profession of questionable origin to an art form through showmanship, ingenuity, and bravado. Tonight, on the anniversary of his death, we bring together a group of stellar magicians who come here to pay tribute to the unique, magical talent of the man. And later on tonight, for the first time on live television, we will conduct a seance to reach the spirit of the great Houdini, the gap Houdini said he would try to bridge. So in keeping with the spirit of the evening, let me start out with a trick of my own. If you will watch very carefully as I clap my hands together three times, one, two, three. My friends, my friends, that was a camera trick accomplished by matching the free tape piece we shot earlier today with the live shot you're seeing now. We did it to call attention to the fact that that's the only camera trick you'll see tonight on this stage. Everything else you see in this theater, where Houdini was scheduled to play just before his tragic death in 1926, is happening live just as our audience sees it and just as you're seeing it at home. Now it's time to get things underway. We begin, however with an escape that almost took Houdini's life. He designed the escape. He even designed the poster. But when he tried to execute the buried alive escape, it was to be the closest call he ever had, and he vowed never to perform it again. Tonight, Steve Shaw, a young man from Houston, Texas, dedicated to the spirit of the master, will attempt to perform for the first time his version of this dangerous escape, this death-defying escape, buried alive. And because it is Halloween, and a night when anything can happen, and probably will, we now switch live to Showtime's and at the movies, Bill Harris, who is standing by with Steve, ready to risk his life on this Halloween night in the most appropriate of ghoulish places, a cemetery located somewhere you, Bill. in Los Angeles. Although, yes. <laughs> Although, this may start a whole underground movement for this kind of trick. <laughs> we caution you at home not to try it. We'll check back with you over the course of the program to see just how you're doing, Bill. And I guess we can look at it this way. If it doesn't work out, why, at least you don't have to move or change wardrobe. When we come back, you'll meet an amazing group of people whose passion in life is the study of the great Houdini. And you'll see for yourself why Houdini's metamorphosis illusion remains today, 86 years after it was first performed, as one of magic's greatest illusions. from the Orpheum Theater in Los Angeles. Welcome to The Search for Houdini. Hosted by William Shatner. And starring Harry Blackstone Jr., David Copperfield, Glenn Falkenstein and Francis Willard, Dean Gunnerson, Bill Harris, The Pen Dragons, Penn and Teller, The Amazing Randy, Steve Shaw, and Bob Steiner. And featuring rare footage of Harry Houdini. Some never seen before on television. Before we meet our next guest, let's take a brief but important look at the humble beginnings of Harry Houdini, the man who would come to change the world. We do know that he was born in 1874, the same year as Winston Churchill and Robert Frost. But whether the date was March 24th or April 6th depends upon which calendar you believe. And though Houdini himself claimed Appleton, Wisconsin as his birthplace, there is now reason to believe that he was actually born in Europe and brought here as a baby by his rabbi father, Samuel Weiss. As a child, young Eric Weiss showed no particular interest in magic but his first attraction toward performing seems to have been when his parents set up a trapeze and bar set 
in his backyard. Eric would spend hours at these, and it wasn't long before he was putting on shows for the neighborhood kids, charging admission. Eric ran away from home at the age of 12, spent a year on the road with tent shows and small traveling circuses, and then rejoined his family when he learned his father had moved to New York. It's here where Eric Weiss leaves off, and Harry Houdini begins at the Garment District Sweatshop, where he met an early friend, Jack Heyman. It was with Jack that he found the book of a famed French magician, Robert Houdin, that led him to his new name. And it was also with Jack that he developed the trick that was to elevate him to the rank of the world famous, Metamorphosis. Though the metamorphosis was the first solution to bring Houdini into the limelight, it was soon to be surpassed by something else. Another idea sprung from the mind that always seemed to know what the public wanted and was ready to figure out a way to give it to them. It was after his first flush of success in America that Harry and Bess left for England, still somewhat unknown, but confident couple of youngsters, set on finding success abroad and returning to the U.S. as conquering heroes. But the bookings were sparse, and as good as Metamorphosis and their other handcuff escapes they did were, they didn't seem enough to ignite the conservative English audience. But when Houdini issued a challenge to Scotland Yard that he could escape any cuffs they could put him in, that was the beginning. Realizing what publicity value, not to mention popular appeal, lay in challenging officialdom and foiling authority, Harry now knew he had the means to become world famous. And he did. Upon his arrival in every European capital, he issued a challenge to any and all takers to create an obstacle from which he could not escape. Then he went to the media and invited them to cover the ceremony. And that was that. Each evening, Houdini's exploits were splashed in newspapers across the continent and seats filled faster than a flying deck of cards as people flocked to see this unique escape artist. He escaped from leg irons and manacles in Dresden, from police straitjackets in Berlin, and a seemingly escape-proof packing box in Essen, as well as astounding audiences all over Europe with similar feats. It was Houdini's ability to promote himself that led us to ask escape artist and Houdini devotee, Dean Gunnison, to help us give a little promotion of our own. As Houdini had done exactly 72 years and one month before, we sent Canadian escape artist Dean Gunnison to the corner of 8th and Hill Streets in downtown Los Angeles, one block from where we stand right now. That's where the old Los Angeles Express Tribune newspaper building was. And from the accompanying photos, you can see what Houdini did there. Let me read while the greatest street throng in the history of Los Angeles gazed on in awe, Houdini, the Orpheum's wizard of escape, defied death and freed himself from a regulation police straitjacket while suspended in the air, head downward, in front of the Express Tribune building shortly after noon today. And so that's what we asked Dean Gunnison to do. Let's take a look at the scene of 8th and Hill as it was Thursday morning when Dean became our Houdini in getting the press to take notice of our show. <laughs> Houdini's return from Europe in 1904 was every bit as triumphant as he may have dreamed it would be four years earlier. And he repeated his successes in the U.S. and became the best known and most respected magician in America. Using his promotional sense, he crisscrossed the U.S., playing the Orpheum circuit like the theater we're in tonight and thrilling crowds everywhere he went. His press clippings preceded him and convinced bookers to play him and play him long and Harry and Bess achieved fame, power, and money. 
He expanded his repertoire of escapes to include any kind of container known to man, often linking himself to well-known companies who produced things that he used to escape from. In a way, he was the first show business act to tie in with sponsors, and he did it all. But as with many men who were bigger than life, there was a dark side to Harry, too. Harry had always been interested in the mortality of man. As a man the public perceived to be flirting with death every night and twice on Sunday, there had to be a strange side to Houdini. And it was to exhibit itself in a compelling manner as of July 17th, 1913, the date of the death of Harry's mother, Cecilia Weiss. If Houdini and Bess enjoyed a close relationship, it was nothing compared to the devotion that he had for his mother. It was she to whom he displayed the trappings of his success, showering her with gifts and trying to erase forever the poverty in which she had dwelt for so many years. And so when she died, it was a crushing blow to the man for whom giving was such pleasure. His grief, which for a time threatened to destroy his career, gave way to a resolve to contact her in the beyond. Maybe it was because she died before he had a chance to say goodbye. But whatever it was, Harry became consumed with talking to her beyond the grave. He went back to work, toured for a while, then went to Hollywood to make films, but never got over his need to make peace with his mother. He made a series of attempts to contact her, none of which worked, a fact which turned him from a hopeful believer into a bitter skeptic. One of his early attempts included a study of the famed Davenport Brothers, a pair of onstage mediums who were very popular in the late 1800s. Their act consisted of the use of a spirit cabinet, a device which seemed to guarantee an honest communication with the beyond. Though the secrets of the Davenport Brothers may have died with them, the tradition of the spirit cabinet passed on from generation to generation. In Houdini's time, a similar device was used by the great magician Willard. And today, Willard's daughter, Frances and Glenn Falkenstein, still perform a true version of the cabinet. It is interesting to note that Frances originally performed this trick with her father when she was a child. It has come to be a magician's magician trick, and we present it to you tonight because it helps set the stage for our upcoming appointment. You know, it was Houdini's desire to perfect Buried Alive, which he never would, that led him to perhaps his most exciting illusion, the packing box escape. In this escape, Houdini would first be manacled, placed in a packing box that was then nailed shut, and finally placed in a river, a lake, an ocean, any body of water that offered the greatest immediate jeopardy. As he moved closer to perfecting the packing box escape, it became a much different escape than Buried Alive, but it definitely captured the attention of the public in the various cities in which it was performed. The city of some of Houdini's greatest triumphs was also the city he called home for much of his life, New York. And that's where we go now to join our next special magical guests. They are right now, they're preparing for their Broadway show which opens November 24th, as well as their new movie, Penn and Teller Get Killed. Will you please welcome Penn and Teller! Hey, I sure hope Bill Shatner narrates our footage after we're dead. We're Penn and Teller. We are not part of this so-called tribute to Houdini. There are liars on this show. We are not a part of it. What bigger lie can you imagine than the so-called duplication of Houdini's greatest feats? The Pendragons are trying to convince you that by doing the same trick four seconds quicker, they are paying homage to Houdini's memory. This is not tribute. This is one-upmanship. Lies, 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 and we will not be part of it. The only reason we allowed our names to be used in this special is because someone had to give Houdini's point of view against this posse of fibbers. We knew Houdini. He was our friend. We admired him, and he often referred to himself as Penn and Teller's biggest fan. When Houdini died, he left all his equipment and apparatus to us. But you know Bess, yap, 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 till we finally gave the equipment to her. But the one thing she couldn't wrench from our deserving hands was the friendship we had with Hare, as we called him. And if there's one thing we learned over our 30 years of friendship with the great Harry Houdini, it's that he never wanted anyone to duplicate his miracles. 
He also was the one that suggested that Teller keep his mouth shut if we really wanted to make any money. We are wearing two of the actual straitjackets that Houdini wore. Teller is wearing one from the early part of his career, and I'm wearing one from right after he gained 60 pounds to play the part of a washed-up prize fighter in a Scorsese film. As you can see, these jackets are buckled tightly across our back. There's a crotch strap running between our legs, stopping us from sliding them off over our heads and making our trousers fit in a more attractive way. Only the king of escapes could liberate himself from these bonds. How you doing, Teller? <laughs> I haven't got a clue either. Mark, let us out. Which you? Yeah, do me first. Wow. Yeah. Damn, Houdini was good. Don't take our word for it. We're in Mario Houdini died on October 31st, 1926. Performing in Montreal, he was hit in the stomach by a McGill University student who wanted to test the legendary muscular control of the magician. Though he recovered from the blows without any apparent problem, in fact, the student had burst Harry's appendix. And by the time it was discovered several days later, peritonitis had set in. The doctors all agreed that it was fatal, that his body was filled with gangrene, and it was only a matter of hours. But they hadn't figured on Houdini, once again ready to face death and laugh in its face. But this time, death would be the winner. And though he struggled for a week, it was apparent that the end was near. As he lay dying, he summoned Bess and whispered to her the secret words by which she would know if he could communicate from beyond the grave. And still he clung to life. Finally, with his brother Dash and Bess at his side, he died on Halloween, exactly 61 years ago today, playing one last trick. It fell to Bess to continue the legacy, to maintain the legend, and maintain it she did. True to his life, in death she perpetuated the myth. Armed with the message that only she knew, she attempted to communicate with her husband many times through mediums, ministers, etc. A well-documented incident involving Reverend Arthur Ford, who seemed to have two key words, Rosabel, believe, occurred. But Bess recanted that Ford had gotten the message from Harry and sent Ford away, unsuccessful, like the others. But each Halloween, Bess made a serious attempt to reach Harry. For 10 years, she held private vigils with articles from his life, hoping against hope to receive some message. Finally, in 1936, here in Los Angeles, she held her final seance. Tonight, 51 years after Bess Houdini blew out the candle and proclaimed that her quest to reach her late husband across the veil had ended, our journey and begins. so, the 61st year passes and still no word from Houdini. I know that we all hope and think that someday he will make his appearance, but those of you around the table who tried so hard, John Gaughan, do you think Harry Houdini will ever come back? Thank you. A wonderful evening, and so passes the 61st Halloween since Houdini's death. Still, we have no visible sign that he has communicated from beyond. But perhaps somewhere over there, Harry Houdini, nay, Eric Weiss, is looking down with a big smile on his face. Because he has achieved an immortality of an even more personal nature. His achievements are etched in the monuments of magic. His praises are sung everywhere a magician steps on stage to perform. And his legacy lives far beyond the corporeal form that was buried in the Machpella Cemetery 61 years ago. As long as a child is dazzled by his first card trick, as long as a puff of smoke signals the arrival of a rabbit. And as long as we dream about the impossible, Houdini will live. Thank you and good night.